Well, good afternoon. It's Tuesday afternoon, and it is a beautiful day here in LaPorte. I'm in my backyard. I thought that I would share with you what I shared with the Sunday gathering on Sunday morning and uh, just spend a few minutes with you and uh, let you know what's going on. Now, I do live next to an airport. So if you hear an airplane that flies over in the middle of the lesson, it's not that uh, we're in Syria and being bombed. It's just the uh, Laporte International Metropolitan Airport flying over, and we will be in good shape. Before we go any further, let me tell you we have a few things coming up. Uh, let me check my handy-dandy notes and uh, share those with you. Our Sunday gatherings at D&D, &D, and they are really going well. Man, if you if you don't go to church, but yet you want to hear a little bit about Jesus and, and how he can affect your life, you need to come. And not only will you hear me speak, but you'll hear a lot of everybody else as they ask questions and tell their story. May 6th, May the 20th, June the 3rd, July, or June uh, 17th and July 1st are the days for the gatherings. You can back that up and look at those again. And then the Monday night gatherings that we have here at our house are on the May 14th, June 11th, and July 9th. And we have some trips coming up. Next one will be April 29th through May 8th. I'll be in northern Ethiopia, up in the very northeast corner in Lalibela. Uh, and uh, hopefully everything will go well there. Now, one of the things that we've talked about is how God changes lives. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 18, uh, he is told to go down to the potter's house and to watch the potter take a, 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 a ball of clay and mold it into what he would have it to be. And so Jeremiah goes down there and there's the potter's wheel and it's spinning and in the back you hear, Oh, my love. No, no, that's an American thing. I'm sorry for those of you international things. That's the, the thing off ghost. But anyway, he's there and he's molding the clay. And, and, and God tells Jeremiah, he says, that's what I do with Israel. That's what I do with my children. I mold them and I make them into what I want them to be. Isaiah picks that up in Isaiah chapter 45, and he says, Who are you as the clay to talk to the potter and say, What are you doing? What are you doing? Are you crazy? This hurts. It's uncomfortable. And he says to the clay, or the potter says to the clay, Hey, you belong to me. I can mold you and make you the way that I want you to be. So we have this idea of God being the the, the the potter and we are the clay. So how is it that he shapes us? How is it that he molds us? Well, one way is through his word. Uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Paul says, don't be conformed to the way that the world thinks and the way that the world reasons and the way that the world responds but by to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, constantly bring God's word into your mind so that you can let it change you. Uh, Psalms 119 talks about this. How can you keep away from sin? Hide God's word in your heart. Uh, uh, scriptures like that that, 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 that that tell us if we if we listen to them and we ingest them and we put them into practice, they are going to change our thinking and change our lives. As a matter of fact, if you look over in Paul, when he writes to Timothy, he says there's about five or six reasons that God has given us this word. Uh, this is in 2 Timothy 3.16 and 2 Timothy 4, and you hear this over and over and over from me. But he says it's for doctrine, for teaching. In other words, I'm going to tell you the truth, the truth about where you came from, about where you're going, the truth about God, the truth about love, the truth about life. Where are you going to find that? Through God's word. It's for correction, or excuse me, for rebuke and instruction, to tell you what not to do and to tell you what to do. Not only is he going to tell you the things to avoid in life, but he's also going to tell you the things that you should be doing in life. 
and then for correction. And, and this is an amazing word. It has this idea of taking that which is broken, putting it back into place so that it may be mended and whole again. God's word, when we listen to it and we obey it, can heal our lives. It can heal a church. It can heal a family. It can heal a nation. And then finally, for encouragement. We're going, to get, we're, we're going to get slapped down in this world. We live in a broken world with broken people, and from time to time, our lives are just going to get knocked down. We can go to God's Word for encouragement. So the five functions of God's Word, all of those teach us and, and prepare us to be a blessing and to be blessed. It molds us into what He wants us to do. That's the easy way. But there's another way, and that is through life. We go through life, and we face trials and temptations. We face difficulties. We face hard times, and sometimes they're hard times of our own doing, and, and sometimes they're hard times just because we live in a broken world, and and sometimes it's because somebody else has screwed us over. And sometimes I, it's sometimes in other nations, it's persecution. It's just, man, it's hard. And the thing about following God, the thing about following Jesus, being a follower of Jesus, is that he says, I'm going to use those times to mold you and to make you. Um, in Psalms 37, verse 4, it says, Delight yourselves in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. That Hebrew word for delight has a connotation of being soft and pliable. Uh, are you soft and pliable in God's hands? Uh, uh, are you willing to work with Him and cooperate with Him? Or are you fighting Him every step of the way? The children of Israel, the Hebrews, were brought out of Egypt. And God put them in this, this spin cycle this walking around in the desert for 40 years, and he says, I'm, I've got a purpose in this. And my purpose in this is this. And this is found in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 through, two through 3. I'm going to humble you. So one of the things that God wants to do when we're going through difficulties in life is to humble us. When you get to the very root of being humbled, Pride says, look at me, look at what I'm doing. I can take care of this myself. I am very self-sufficient. God says, I don't want you to be self-sufficient. I don't want you to look around and say, look at what I've done. I want you to understand that without me, all this is meaningless. So rather than being self-sufficient, he wants us to be God-sufficient. So he humbles us. It's almost as if he allows situations or puts us in situations or situations come our way that are so difficult that finally we get to the end of our rope and we say, God, I can't. You must. If anything is going to, if I'm going to learn anything from this, it's going to be because you teach me. So help me learn what's going on. Rather than being self-sufficient, I want to be God-sufficient. I want to rely on him. The next thing he says, I'm going to do this to prove your character. I'm going to test you to prove your character. I'm going to allow situations to come your way to show what is in your heart. You say, well, who are we proving this to? Who are we showing this to? If God knows everything, if God knows everything, which he does, doesn't he already know what's in our heart? And the answer is yes. But sometimes we think we do. And we get into a situation and then all of a sudden we see things spilling out of our heart and spilling out of our mind that maybe we wished weren't there. Someone once said that, that, that hard times are like boiling water. They really expose what's in the tea bag. It shows what's going on. But not only does it expose it to ourselves, it also shows us to other people. It shows what's in our heart to other people. One of the greatest testimony, and this is what's so cool about the gathering on Sunday morning, is that we hear people tell their story of, yeah, I was in this situation. I lost my son. I lost my husband. I lost my job. I was uh, uh, almost ready to get into a fist fight, and, and, and this is what I learned, and, 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 and I felt controlled and abandoned, and, and, and this is what I've learned. And they tell their stories. 
In other words, it doesn't just show what's in their heart to themselves, but it also serves as a testimony of this is what God is like and this is what He's doing in my life. So it reveals what's in our heart to us, it reveals what's in our heart to others, and it helps us to be God-reliant, God-sufficient rather than self-sufficient. And then finally, he says, we're going to find out whether you're going to obey God's commands. In other words, there's what you learned in the gathering on Sunday morning. Now on Tuesday, we're going to put you in a situation to see if you will make the application, to see if you will obey. This is what I spoke to you. This is what I told you to do. This is what you know you should do. You said that you were going to do it at the end of the service or at the end of the lecture or at the end of the chapter, at the end of the song. Now you're in a situation. Let's see if you're going to obey. So over and over and over, he took them through this cycle to make them more dependent upon God, to show what was in their heart, to purify their heart, and also to teach them to obey. In other words, God let these challenges of life come to prepare them to go into the promised land, to prepare them to not only be blessed, but to be a blessing to others. Now, we want our lives to change just from the sermon, just from the scripture. We don't want to go through the trials of life. Those are hard. They hurt. They're embarrassing. They're humiliating. And we don't want to go through that. We want to be a blessing without going through that. And God says, no, nah, that's not the way it usually works. We're going to allow these trials, whether you fail and bring it on yourself, whether somebody else's does, whether it's just part of life, we're going to teach you. We're going to train you. We're going to put you through this experiment to prepare you for that which is going to come. Now, if you think about that, that's what life is. Now, some of you are saying right now, yeah, I'm in one of those situations, and it's somebody else's fault, and it's their fault, or it's the world's fault, or it's God's fault, or it's, and you're pointing out to all these different things so that you can feel better about where you're at in life. Okay, I got you. You can do that. But when you do that, you're really not focusing on what God wants you to do. What is it that God wants you to do? God wants you to learn how to rely more on Him. God wants you to be understanding of what's in your heart and to purify your heart and your mind and your way of thinking and your way of living. And He wants you to obey. And if all you're doing is trying to affix blame, then you're not really cooperating with the Lord. And i got to tell you this, you're going to keep going on in that cycle again and again and again and again. Maybe, just maybe, and we'll come back and touch on this in a second, maybe you should stop worrying about how you got where you were. I mean, you're there. Whether it's your husband's wife or your wife's fault, whether it's somebody else's fault or your own fault, well, okay, you're there. And God says that he's going to use it. Maybe you need to stop worrying about so much about how you got there and focus on where you go from here. Now, before we do this, I want you to understand, this is hard. It's not easy. There's some churches that you'll go to that'll blame it all on the devil. There's some churches that will you can go to, or some places and books you can read, that'll blame it all on the Democrats, or the Republicans, or Donald Trump, or the Ozone, or the fallen society, or the gays, or the straights, and they have all these different places that they place the blame, and you feel like, well, okay, then it's not my fault, and if it's not my fault, it's not my job to allow God to change me. And you'll feel better about yourself, but you won't be changed. You'll feel better about yourself, and you'll be more comfortable but you'll not be a blessing, and you'll miss a blessing. So what I'm telling you is different than maybe what you would hear in a lot of different books or songs or blessings or, or, or churches. 
I'm telling you that God has you right where he wants you. And regardless of how you got there, he's going to use this situation to make you more reliant upon him. He's going to make this situation, he's going to use this situation to teach you and train you and flush out the worldliness, the world's way of dealing with it, the world's way of, 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 of uh, uh, coping with it, and he's going to show you a new way and he's going to teach you and train you that it is better to obey and be blessed than it is to disobey and suffer all these things again and again and again and again. Now, let me tell you, if you value comfort, if the most important thing in your life is to be comfortable, then blame everybody. Go to church and blame the lost society. Go to church and blame the Democrats or the Republicans. Go to church and blame Satan. Go to church and blame your husband and blame your wife. And as long as you're blaming, you can blame everybody but yourself. But the one thing that God's trying to do in that situation is to move you out of your comfort zone to make or allow you to suffer so that you can be changed, molded, into something more beautiful. You want to see how this works? Look at the life of Joseph. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, suffering, thrown into a pit, suffering, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of rape, suffering, thrown into prison, suffering, forgotten in prison, suffering, until finally the arrangement came to where he would interpret the dreams of Pharaoh, and by interpreting the dreams of Pharaoh, move to be second in control and save two nations from famine, to be a blessing to millions of people. And then he says, when he's talking to his brother, God threw me in the pit. God was the one who betrayed me and allowed that to happen. God allowed this to happen. God allowed me to be falsely accused. God allowed me. Why? Because God was preparing me to be something great. So you can either spend your time whining about how terrible life is or understanding that God is at work in your life. Which brings me to James chapter 1. He says, Brothers and sisters, when trouble come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy because you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be complete, needing nothing. Now, if you need wisdom, what do you mean wisdom for what? Wisdom to say, God, what is it you want me to learn? How did I get here? Did I do something wrong? Can I do something right to avoid this? What is it that you want me to learn? What is it, God? Give me wisdom. Help me understand why this is happening, what you're trying to teach me, what you're trying to develop so that I can work with you and learn this so that I can be a blessing to others and receive a blessing in and amongst that time. He'll not rebuke you if you're asking, James says. So he says, listen, if you're going through difficult times, understand that God is at work in your life. You can have peace, shalom, that Hebrew word for a peace that doesn't rely upon what's happening outside but a peace that relies on what's happening inside. A peace because of your confidence in Christ. A peace because He is at work. A peace because of the, uh, the rest that you can find in Him. That's the shalom. Right now it's a beautiful day. Uh, man, it's sunny. The wind's blowing a little bit. My apple trees are doing good. It's very peaceful out here. But just the other night we had a big old thunderstorm come through. The wind was blowing, everything was going on, and it wasn't very peaceful externally. Peace that God gives is a peace that doesn't depend upon the weather, a peace that doesn't extend to the circumstances, a peace that isn't reliant upon whether things are going good or going bad. It is a peace that you can have in the midst of difficult situations. Take that peace. Know that God is at work in your life. Know that He is preparing you to be a blessing to others. 
to make you more like Him, to develop that character, to stamp out that self-reliance, to make you more reliant upon Him. Look to Him rather than looking at your circumstances to obey, that He's at work in your life and that this may be something that takes weeks and months and years, but he's constantly at work in your life so you can rest in that. And by doing that, you can then ask him, God, what is it you want me to learn? Now, at the end of every lesson at the gathering, we talk and we have a responsive reading. Um, it's more of a prayer, but I want to share it with you. Here's the notes. You can see them at the bottom. But it says this. God, I am overwhelmed, afraid, and uncertain about what's going on in my life. And we respond, I am with you, Mark. You are not alone. God, I really don't know what to do. I cannot find my way through this alone. Ask me, Mark. And I'll give you wisdom, direction, and understanding as you walk and obey. God, my heart is breaking. Though I do not fully understand, I will strive to trust and obey you. And God responds, when you do this, you will experience my peace. It's a peace unlike you have ever known. Mark, I love you, and I'm working in your life. How should you respond to troubles? Don't get angry. Don't get bitter. Don't get resentful. Go to God and say, God, I know you're at work in my life. What is it that you want me to learn? What is it that you're wanting me to do? Give me wisdom in how to respond. Understand that this is difficult and this prayer may be prayed through tears, through pain, and through suffering. But in the midst of that tears and pain and suffering, you can have joy. You can have peace. You can have rest. Shalom. Guys, this is hard. But it's a new way of understanding what God is doing. I hope God has spoken to your life. Once again, we meet on the first and third Sunday of the month at D&D's restaurant there in Laporte. The address will be in some of the graphics and the rest of this. So I want you to come. You're welcome. Everybody's welcome to come. Coffee and conversation. But this, these are the things that we talk about, about how to understand life from the biblical perspective. Again, keep me in prayers because I'm going to be up in Thompsonville this Sunday, and then I'm going to be at Northside Baptist Church on the 29th of Sunday, and I'll be preaching there in Texas City. And then that night I'll be leaving to go northern Ethiopia, Keep us in your prayers. Once again, feel free to share this. Thanks, guys. Have an amazing day.